Bull in a China Shop TV, not just a YouTube channel, your main source for bull breed entertainment. I offer video services such as stud features, kennel features, and full event coverage. I also offer photography services such as puppy shoots, individual dog shoots, and full kennel shoots. You can see examples of each on any and all Bull in a China Shop social media pages. You can also see an in-depth look into my life and the American Bully lifestyle with my vlog found on the YouTube channel as well. Bull in a China Shop TV is also the home of the Bull in a China Shop podcast, a real, raw, uncut podcast dedicated to the bull breeds and the American Bully lifestyle. You can find all episodes of the Bull in a China Shop podcast, stud features, kennel features, event features, and all of the vlogs on youtube.com forward slash bull n a china shop tv check it out and hit subscribe today Yo, you beautiful motherfuckers. Guess what time it is? Guess what time it is? It's Bull in the China Shop podcast time. Hey, hey, where are you guys going to be November 11th? I'll tell you where I'm going to be. ABKC Nationals. ABKC Nationals is the annual end of year prestige event hosted by the ABKC where the top dogs of the year come to compete. November 11th, Chicago, Illinois, at the world-famous Navy Pier. Uh, there will be exclusive trophies, coveted ABKC Best in Show multi-breed statue. The festivities will be judged by Senior Judge Rolando Mata and multi-breed judge Ty Lumley. That's me. Hey, hey, I'm judging nationals. Award ceremonies honoring vets. And a special dedication to uh, to the Wounded Warrior with the annual Wounded Warrior statue. There will also be titling and awarding of the ABKC Top Dogs for 2017. There will be worldwide attendance of the following breeds. American Bully, French Bulldog, Shorty Bull, English Bulldog, Old English Bulldog, Bull Terrier, Mini Bull Terrier, Cane Corso, and American Pit Bull Terrier. There will also be vendors food, and of course, activities for your shitty ass kids. It's a family event, so bring the shitty kids. abkcnationals.com. Ticket sales, booth sales, hotel info, parking info, uh, where you can put your shitty kids during the show. All that can be found, abkc-nationals.com. See you motherfuckers November 11th. Navy Pier in Chicago. Obviously, the shitty kids' statements are jokes, but also, you guys have some pretty shitty kids out there. Actually, speaking of shitty kids, there was a show. There was a show earlier this year where shitty kids were smearing shitty shit on the walls of the bathroom. That's a fact. That's not even something I made up. That is a fucking fact okay get you i mean seriously where's your where is the parents when there's just kid smearing like graffitiing shit on the side of the bathroom walls where is the fucking parents anyway this week uh long time friend of the podcast previous guest returning once again i call him dr wilson you guys know him as tyler wilson the owner of Nationals winner, Grand Champion Axel. How you doing, Bob? Pretty good. <laughs> Pretty good. We uh, we've actually been talking dogs all night already. 
and we were supposed to get this microphone out like approximately four hours ago. <laughs> Just didn't happen. Uh, did not happen. We're also doing a test. The people listening to this uh, podcast won't be able to see this, but we're also doing a video test with the, the new cameras that I got f- specifically for the podcast, but just to test so I can so I can figure out how to edit and clip that shit together. So hopefully, moving forward, not hopefully, definitely moving forward, all the podcasts I do will be full video. So if you haven't yet, check out youtube.com forward slash bull in the china shop tv all the videos i have around there already now what i what i kind of uh forced tyler into talking about tonight not really forced but we were we were having a conversation earlier about international sales all right everybody i feel like a lot of not everybody but a lot of our goal a lot of the the top tier guys, top tier breeder, upper echelon guys. A lot of the goal is to get your stock, your yard, your productions all over the globe, right? But there's a lot, there's shit that a lot of people don't take into consideration. Whether you're going to Asia, whether you're going to mm-hmm. Australia, the UK, Europe. Even South Africa now is starting to have uh, shows and they're starting to get dogs. Wherever you're at or wherever you you are aiming to send dogs to, there's a bunch of shit that comes along with it that, that, you know, a lot of people don't realize. Also, on top of that, the emotional factor, which when you're selling dogs for... 15,000, 20,000, 25,000, 50,000, 100,000 dollars. You wouldn't think that there would be a big emotional factor in there, but trust me, it's harder than you think it is. I I just went through this today. That's why we were having this conversation. Now, you personally have sold multiple dogs. A, mo- the majority of your business now is international. Correct. Would you say it's easier to sell dogs domestically or internationally? As far as like the the amount of work that goes into actually shipping that dog and making that that sale and and um, could you because you got to communicate with the people. You know, sometimes there's a language barrier. Would you say it's easier here, or would you s- still say that? It's easier to do international because of the the market boom, basically. As far as the work goes and the time put in, I would say international overseas is definitely more difficult because of all the rabies shots, the vet visits, right. and everything's got to be timed properly, and plane tickets, and now when when you say. When you say shots and, and and shit has to be timed right, what do you what do you mean? What are you talking about? There's a lot of tests. Well, it depends on which country you're going to, but you know, there's a lot of tests that go involved that certain countries uh, require before the dog can even get in there. Um, you know, like a rabies shot. In my experience, has been 21 within 21 days before it gets into the country. So, if right. you're 21 days and you have three days of shipping and that's out of that 21 days you're shit out of luck so <clears throat> everything's got to be timed just right and and certain countries are i've heard australia i've never shipped australia but i heard australia is a real real tough one to get into just with everything that goes in right vet visits and all that other stuff well from well, usda from, stamps and all kinds of stuff from what i was from what i gathered from the the conversations i had with the the bully enthusiasts that were in Australia when I was there. It's like a a 180 day quarantine, yeah. right? And that has to be done here right. or there, right? So if you right. want to send the dog at four months, it still has to sit for uh, 60 days or whatever in quarantine once it gets to Australia. <laughs> if you don't want to go through that process, if the people buying the dog don't want to quarantine on the island, then, then you're keeping the dog till it's six months old before right. you can even start the process to ship it. Right. And then, like you're saying, once it hits six months, 
then you're looking at a 20, 21 day window where you've got to get that, that rabies shot. And then you've got to wait 21 days. Mm -hmm. And then the dog has to have a lot of times we're going to islands. You have to do a titer test on the, right. uh, for the, for the rabies also to make sure that the actual rabies virus is present or the, the, what do you, the immune, uh, what do you call them? The cursors, precursors, maybe. Yeah. Because it's a modified live virus. Right, the right. So you, they're doing the, the titer test to make sure that that dog has enough built up in its system right. to be safe. So a lot of the times it, with Australia, now I, I haven't shipped to Australia. I shipped uh, the closest thing probably would be Guam. Right. That'd be, yeah. Guam was a four-month quarantine. It was a, a 90 days, but that was 90 days. The quarantine couldn't start until he had his rabies shot. So right. he couldn't even have his rabies shot till 12 weeks. Right. So then you've got another three months on that 12 weeks. So you're looking at a seven month old dog before he's leaving. Right. So, or six month old dog. But again, then you go through the whole process of setting up the flight. So he's probably six and a half months before he mm -hmm. actually leaves. The work is probably more difficult. Definitely. Do you feel like there's a, a bigger demand from Definitely. international? For me personally, yeah. I mean, there. I don't know if it, maybe that's the way that just kind of the dice rolled for me, but uh, you know, we get we get some inter, uh, we get some people from the states that'll that'll ask, but you know, our target and the way that we've kind of designed things has been overseas. Right. So, you know, we. We have some friends who will, you know, will place dogs with, but most of most of our stuff goes over there, and and the work is worth it, I think, because you're building your brand worldwide. You know, people in the states, even before Axel, you know, people knew knew us just from the showing. Yeah, from know. handling, everywhere. right? Yeah, you know. So now, you know, you that'll know, happen when you're kicking ass every single weekend. You know, people start to take notice of that well, shit. Yeah. But I mean, I feel like you, you went, there was like six, 16 months where you never lost. I feel like every dog you took <laughs> in the ring, what's, what's crazy to me is the, the progression that you, you, you guys have went through from starting out as PCK and a, a handler that didn't really know shit about handling dogs, but had, you know, obviously you handled cattle and sheep and shit before, right. but to go from there to literally making a living traveling and handling a, a good living right. you know what i mean for a lot of people in the country more than they're making in their weekly paycheck all the way to now winning nationals and the majority of your business being international sales i feel like that's first of all that's like a crazy fast progression mm -hmm. insane most people couldn't even handle that shit it's tough. To be honest with you, there's a lot of things that you have to learn in that process to continue progressing. Right. You know what I mean? So it's a crazy fast progression, but I feel like you guys have handled it like amazing. And the fact that you're the majority of your, your interests now, let's not say sales, but the majority of your interests now is coming from international buyers. Right. Well, and that... The way that we've handled Axel, not uh, with his breedings and things like that, I feel like that the way that that was handled between Jamie and I built more of an international market because there's not a lot of people that that have used Axel. We, right. we didn't, you know, he's very restricted to the females that we let breed. And so this wasn't a, a forethought at all, but now people come to us. They don't necessarily ask for an Axel stud fee. Or to use Axel, but they ask about puppies, you know. And I, I, I don't know why, but I have zero interest in sending semen over to overseas, you know, as far as putting it in a bank and letting, you know, selling five credits to one guy, and he has. That just doesn't interest me because I can't control what females are getting bred to. I, mean, I don't know if that's selfish or whatever, but I don't think it's a right or wrong thing. It's yeah, just, I, just I, your stance on it, you know. Yeah, and I think I think there's value in both you know both sides because the people that are sending semen over there are building the market, they're building the the quantity of dogs, and and the dogs that are going over there are obviously quality. You know, you're not going to get Joe for the shit, most part. You're not going to get Joe shit the ragman that's sending twelve 
12 frozen straws to Russia and people are going to jump on them, you know? But I feel oh, like... Oh, I see what you mean. You're saying the dogs that are getting sent over have, right. have a, a market here and a, have a name built and a reputation right. built. And they're, you know, they're they're rising stars, if not stars already, before right. the shit gets sent over. Yeah, there. yeah so, I would agree with that. And, and, and I feel like those people have a better... Well, yeah, I'm just going to say it. Have a better grasp on a quality dog, too, because they're not... They're not getting. You, you don't sell a twenty five hundred dollar dog to China, right? You know? They're right. not. They're not coming in and saying, "Hey, I want your third pick." That's a fact. They're coming in and be like, "Hey, you know, we want to buy your top pick, and you name a price, and they jump on it, and it, you know, you're like, blows you away." Yeah, I you wish know? I should. I wish I would have said <laughs> a higher price. Right. Let's negotiate down instead of kicking <laughs> yourself in the face. But you know, it, I just feel like the the people over there. I don't know. I don't know anything about international culture, but I don't know if, if they just have more money or if they do honestly have a better grasp on a better dog, you know, cause that's what I, that's what I see mostly with international is that, that, you know, you, you got Magoo that went over there and Rocco's going crazy over there. Grimm's headed over there. You know, those are quality, quality American bullies and you know, that, those are the dogs they're yeah, after. And a similar type of dog. Right. You yeah. Know? Extreme features. American bullies. Amer- real deal American right. bullies. Right. And I think that's that's awesome that they're building their, their base with that, that stuff. But going back to, to what you were saying, you, you really feel like building your brand first right. and building that stud up first is key with international stuff. Because like you're saying... They're not. They're not calling for stud dog A. Right. They're calling for the nationals winner. Right. They're calling for grand champion Rocco. They're calling for you know, not Asia so much, but they're you know Europe and Australia. They're calling for my you know maestro. Right. So like they're they're searching out and and spending money on high quality shit. Right. I see what you're saying though about the semen, because once you put that semen in someone else's hands, they pick a bitch and that it gets bred. Right. And that's that's the same concept as here, you know. Even though they would pay more, oh yeah, they, they would right, pay. Right. You know, they'll buy five straws at full price instead of you know somebody over here is going to if they buy two, they're asking for a discount on the second one. But, or they're they're asking you to dr- how low will you go on the stud fee right, for the first right. motherfucker? <laughs> yeah. But I, I just feel like the way that we handled them here, it would kind of be going against everything that we've done to send 10 straws over to, you know. To, as far as Axel goes. Right, right. As right. far as uh, being selective with the bitches that he's been right. bred to. If we can control, you never can control what the puppies are going to look like, obviously. But, you know, if the if when people contact me from overseas um, recently, a gal from Russia contacted me and said she wanted to buy the top picks. You know, that's kind of tough to swallow, but at the same time, you know, she's probably going to take care of them. I did as much research as I could on her. Well, the thing is, you know, I feel like somebody that's going to spend that kind of money, whatever the actual figures are, it's not cheap to buy first and second pick for Tyler Wilson, I guarantee it. So if somebody that's spending that kind of money... Right. You can almost guarantee those dogs are going to be treated how they should be treated. Obviously, they're going to be bred, and she's going to want to make money in the future off them, right. which ensures the fact that they're going to be treated how you right. think they should be treated, or at least partially ensures the fact. Right. You would think that somebody spending $10,000 on a second pick puppy would take care of the fucking thing, right. especially if it's an investment to where they're looking to make money back in the future. Right. And... Before before I even agreed to taking the money, I made sure I asked her about her longevity in the breed and her ideals of the breed. You know what what was her what was her next generation going to look like? Where was she going to go after this? Right. You know, because I I don't want I don't want them to get my pick that I would normally keep and breed to some who knows what to create bad dogs because then that reflects axel in a different country so now some people are going to see the second generation and think well axel you know, and maybe that's their first impression of axel right. maybe exactly. they've only seen axel in pictures and that's their first impression of his production right. 
That's a good point, man. That's a solid fucking right. point. So actually, speaking of Axel, <laughs> if you can hear <laughs> the fucking chainsaw going in the background, that would be the Nationals winner. He decided to drop by, hang out for the podcast. Uh I think I think the fact that you're you're go, you're approaching it that way that's that's super dope and I feel like a lot of a lot more people should be more selective with their stuff. I've kind of walked the 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 line in between both right. where I've been fairly selective with what Maestro's bred to but at the same time we have semen in four on four continents right now. Right. You know what I mean? Or three continents right, right. now. Four coming soon. So, but the semen I'm sending over there is under my control. Right. Right. So the, the I'm not, I'm not selling five to one person right. exclusively, and then not at least having input at, to what the bitches right. are bred to. You know what I mean? Especially with the the European straws that they're all they're all being sold individually, and right now he's close, so nothing's being sold. But they're all being sold individually, and that's just just like I would sell a stud fee here. Right. Somebody would send me, you know, pics and pet of their female, talk about what they want to add to their female. If Maestro's the dog to add that, then we'll, then we move forward. If he's not, I recommend a different dog. That's like foreign language to most people right. that have a stud. You know, most people are not going to send a customer to a different dog. Fortunately, I have friends, right, and I'm not a jealous cunt. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> So, if I know that there's a dog, like, let's say, Axel, as far as headpiece, short back, two things that probably you're not going to come to Maestro for, right? right. So, if, if a bitch, that's what a bitch needs, I might say, hey, you know what, Axel's a better fit for her, hit up Tyler Wilson. Or, uh, another example is, like, if... You know, somebody hits me up where... It, it, the reason I'm selling them individually is if somebody hits me up and the, and the bitch is like subpar, she's really young, then I can say, you know, listen, maybe that's not the best female. Maybe let's try this bitch because I know if you have multiple bitches, right. maybe let's try this bitch or let's just wait till your female hits another heat. You know, skip a heat and then we'll go from there. But it's a fine line and I see exactly what you're saying because if you just sell... Let's say somebody bought five Maestro studs and owned exclusive rights to them. I'm no longer even in the in the. I'm not a middleman at all. Right. I'm not having any kind of uh, even input or insight into into what he's doing. Right. But I also see value on a kind of a selfish level on on the the people that do send semen over there because without that, there may not be a market for my style of of promotion or my style of sending dogs because you're not getting that from me. Right. So without, without you sending your semen over there and getting bitches bread, I don't have a market, you know, they, or they have to come if they come, if they come directly to me, you know, then they've got to wait a year. And if there's no semen over there or there's no other dogs over there, then they've got, they're buying puppies, right? Then they've got to buy from me again or another guy that has puppies, you know? So now you've got a year gap. And, you know, we all know how people's minds can change over a year. So three, that, di- three different times, right. four different times that over whole, a year. That whole scenario could be completely irrelevant without your, you know, your mentality of sending it over there. hundred percent. So I have no stock. I have no market value over there. Right. So we, we have that. to, we have to do both. I mean, we have to have both approaches. Yeah. The f- but I like the fact that you have kept him so exclusive that people don't even want studs now they're looking for puppies well Could, yeah go ahead and i think that w- when when axel first come out even the first picture you know we started getting some interest and people were pissed like people had never been turned down before i don't think oh no it's people don't people don't, people don't say no to three grand right and, and they were you just know? blown away and we lost a lot of close friends over the deal i had i had friends up the road that i had even given my old stock too and they wanted to breed to axel and i told them no you know i i switched for a reason i went through the whole spiel gave them the whole nine yards and i told them no it's just not going to happen i'm sorry but on the, and, on and the flip side of that them. on the flip side of that 
were they were they really that close of friends if that's what it all it took really to cut them out? But that's not even what I was going to say. I just that came to my my brain. But on the flip side of that, look at the the quality of stuff that Axel has put out there. Right. You know those those two females we were talking about earlier that you just got the update pictures mm-hmm. of Huckleberry out there with Rob Lee. Um, some stuff I've got hidden at the house. You know right. what I mean? Like the quality of stuff that is coming off of him. It's working out in your favor right. because now next year, not this year, maybe not right. even the end of 2017, but 2018, we're going to bring some shit out. People are going to see Stony. Right. People are going to see Huckleberry. People are going to see tri- uh, Triaxle and fucking Fer- Ferdinand. They're going to see them all. You know right. what I mean? And then they're going to be like, oh, fuck. Right. We, we missed the train. That's where you're still going to be having Axel right. Litters and still going to, that's, you know, the demand's the still going to be there. Right. Where I got fucked a, a couple of times already, and one of the biggest reasons I closed Maestro was because if I let five people at one time use Maestro, and there's five litters in the country of Maestro puppies, mm-hmm. people know how much of a dickhead I am when it comes to buying shit from me, right. right? I don't really negotiate with people. I don't really lower, I don't lower the prices of anything. I mean, if I put a price up, that's what, that's what the price is, you know? So people would rather deal with someone else because they think they can get a deal right. on my shit. You know what I'm saying? It's not technically my shit because it's just my stud. But then when I've got litters of my own, I'm I'm holding them to a different. I'm you know the the bar for my stuff to me is, is higher than just an outside breeding. Right. Even though those outside breedings are producing really nice shit, the stuff that I'm selling. I've, I've really kind of got to be super selective with because people, you know, people hit you up. Oh, you know, I can get this from this guy for 500 less. Okay. So call that guy. Right. Do it. That's fine. I have no problem. It's still off of my show. Congratulations. Mm-hmm. But now, now people have circumvented me right. to get my shit. <laughs> right. I don't like that. I yeah. don't like that. And I really don't like people making like using maestro solely to make money. Right. And that's happened a few times mm-hmm. where people Sold aren't, out. aren't, yeah, right. aren't, aren't thinking about their program. Right. They're not breeding. They're not using him to improve anything. They're using him because they know he's a fucking money bag. Right. I don't like that shit either. So I, I, I may not ever open him to the public again. I haven't decided on that, but I like that approach because you're keeping him so exclusive and making sure he goes to quality bitches, just setting yourself up for success right. down the line. Maybe not this year. Right. Maybe you lose twenty, thirty thousand this year by not selling the studs. But then down the line, now you've got an international market. Mm-hmm. You've got quality productions in every corner of the fucking planet, and you've got people searching for puppies three, four years later. Right. That's dude. That's spot on. I mean, that's that's the way to go about it, especially if you're you know bringing an unknown dog out when he's a year old. Whew, that's the way to go. I mean, just the, <clears throat> it, the philosophy behind it, I think is great. Right. The, the problem, I wouldn't say the problem, but what benefited me in that aspect was, is that, okay, so yeah, we have a dog that everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people had interest in, and then he won nationals. So then, you know, a lot of people, but now, they, okay. could, they Hold couldn't on. Let's, get it. Let's open that up. How much did the Nationals change that? How much did Nationals take his stock up? Because I I notice a difference. I notice yeah, uh, at least from the outside looking in, it looked like like a, a just a jump, like a skyrocket. It was uh, it was obviously there's no preparation for that, but it was it was odd because the. The people that were asking for two thousand twenty five hundred dollar puppies disappeared. It's like they knew, you know. And 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 then that's when the global market started coming in. Those people started contacting me and just throwing stupid offers for nothing, you know. Like they were just wanting anything, and it just blew me away. But it's not for nothing. Well, the uh, fucking yeah. dog won it's, nationals. Okay, he blind. won. He, it's like it's a like a dog offer. that wins the Westminster for the right. fucking AKC, or you know the National Dog Show, right. or Crufts for the Kennel Club. You know what I'm saying? Right. 
It's not for nothing. Like they're yeah, yeah. they're searching out the highest qual what they see as the highest quality, what the AKC judge has deemed the highest quality in the nation. Right. Okay. So nothing. Not for bl nothing. Blind. Let's say blind. That's offers. way better. Blind way offers, better yeah. uh, ex explanation. Ever. And that because they have no idea. They're just saying I want something. And they've never seen him in person unless they were you know. X only went to four shows in his entire life and, and competed. So. You know, unless they were at those four shows. Well, that's rough, huh? <laughs> if, if they, unless they were, unless they were at those four, those four shows, they've never seen the dog in person. So right. they're going off pictures. You know, and it, it, that's crazy to me. But that was the influx. Is that kind of the honestly the U.S. market went away, and and the inter, the global market came in. And you insane. think it's you think the U.S. market falling off is because. These motherfuckers are searching for bargains, and I they think, knew once he won nationals, there is no bargain. I think that that's part of it, and the part is that he, he, Axel had the reputation of, well, we had the reputation of turning people down already. Right. You know. So. Oh right. So, and that shit spreads like, oh, like yeah. the game telephone through. There's the There's people community. that I've never met when I was in the Virginia show. Um, there's people that I've never met in my life. Just like come up like kind of cowardly and ask, you think you could accept my female? I'm like, come on, don't, don't come at me like that. Makes me feel bad, you know? Like, come on, you're you're the Gestapo. I, I don't mean to be a dick, you know. I'm not. Females. It's just it's just the way, you know, the way we we designed. And if people can't understand that, that's on them. I feel like like if right. you if you can't step back and look at why someone would do that. I mean, there's two different approaches to it. You know, Khan has hit the the almost the opposite approach with Rocco, right. qual you know quantity getting getting as much out there as he can, building the name as big as he can all over the place. And then there's your approach where breed him to as little as we can and get the best results out of it. Right. And and the, I don't think there's it's a right or wrong. No, I'm not I saying it's a right or no, wrong. It's just I, two different philosophies behind. Like it. I think that that goes along with the the global market I was talking about. You have to have one to have the other. Without without Khan's approach, there isn't there isn't my approach at all. Right. You know, then I'm just a dickhead. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> with, right. Without without especially internationally. Right. And let, you know, let's slide back to that, especially internationally. Without the the female stock being out there, right. without Rocco daughters and Maestro daughters and Grim daughters and you know yeah. every other yeah. all the, every other stud that's being studded internationally, without all those daughters, people people have no reason right. you know to buy males for them, right. or they're they're buying males to get an Axel daughter. You know they bought a Rocco son, right. He's the international nationals winner. Mm -hmm. Now they want a, a Axel daughter to go to there, right. which is the nationals winner to go to. You know, that's how. And and not saying that's right or wrong either, but that's how a lot of these international uh, buyers are are approaching this shit, where yeah. they're lining up the best quality American bullies they can find. But I think it all comes back to building that brand. Building that stud name, the pictures, the shows, the promotion, everything that goes into actually turning your stud into a celebrity. Mm -hmm. Without that, you can't have either approach. Right. Without all that, uh, those foundation blocks laid, you don't get to build the house. Right. You know what I mean? So I feel like you you have to really do it the right way with your stud from day one. Right. And. The, I started on this earlier, but the the thing that helped me the most, I feel, is that I was I was able to do that and make I was able to make a living off of dogs and Axel not be a part of that financial gain because of the handling. I was handling quality right. dogs. Right. I was in public eye with quality dogs every weekend, and you know it, it kept me relevant without Axel keeping me relevant. Well, that so, also gives you a little reputation of good business without even right, doing any business right. because people are trusting you with their animals. Right. They look good every weekend. No one has a complaint. You have no 
public drama with anybody. You know right. what I mean? Nobody's bad business alerts, b- scam alert. You know, that's never <laughs> happened. The little sirens. I saw a couple <laughs> <of those. laughs> that's But that's, your, I mean, your, your name was never attached to that. So you're actually building a reputation of good business before you even start doing business. Right. And that, that goes back even before the rebuild. You know, we were still handling, you know, like Rumblebee. He built a reputation for us. Right. And we, we didn't necessarily have a breeding program to speak of at that point. You know, we were having litters, but nothing genera- generationally. Geez, that was tough. Uh, <laughs> we, you know, we got into the four syllable words. <laughs> yeah, <that> was, <laughs> tripped him up a little. Night. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we didn't have anything that we were going to progress with. We didn't know it at the time, obviously. But, you know, we didn't have anything to progress with. So, right. as a breeding program, there wasn't really much there. But, since we were in the public eye, sh- competing with quality dogs week in and right, week out. Right. That helped keep us, you know, kind of keep us in the in the limelight. And then when Axel came along, we continued to do that. We were we were lucky that he only you know he only had to compete in four shows. Well, not you're not a one trick pony now, right? Once people see you doing, you know, both multiple sides of this shit. A, you you're building a reputation for for good business. B, you're in every fucking picture with the winner for like. Six years, I feel like. <laughs> I haven't even been in. It's like every sh- every show years. for the last six <laughs> years, the winner has been Tyler Wilson. I feel like, and then, and then on top of that, now you've ha- you have this stud that you discovered, right. took from the ground up and won nationals with it. So it's not just a one trick pony now, and and that's the type of shit that these <laughs> international buyers are interested in. Right. You know, not just the. Oh, I bought this dog. You know, I bought him for 10K. I'm going to stud him for 5K. You know, one picture of him on the internet. Never been to a show before. No one's actually seen him but the people that have bred to him. Right. Mo, well, nine times out of 10, that's not really the dog that they're searching after. Right. So, what do you think, if it's, if other than nationals, what do you think is. What do you think is the biggest reason why the majority of your your business is coming internationally? Is it something that you're you're setting up kind of kind of on purpose? Is it just that's how it's happening? Like that that's just the people that are contacting you now, the majority of people or Yeah. You know my social media skills and you know I wouldn't call it a skill. <laughs> well, or lack thereof. <laughs> you know, I I don't, we don't advertise, you know, the, 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 the Russian market now is, is apparently pretty hot. Yeah. Taking off. Yeah. And you know, those people don't know that I even have litters on the ground. Nobody does. Nobody knows about the two litters that I have outside besides, well, you, cause you've seen them. Oh, and firsthand sneak back up behind the scenes, <laughs> bull in the China shop TV. We got the behind of the scenes scoops. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, and it's not, it's definitely not promotion. It's not marketing because I have no abilities there. I, it's, I, it's quality, man. I, it, I really, yeah. I mean, it's I quality really, and reputation. It's what it is. Yep. That, because I, I talked to Jesse about it the other day. I'm like, how, how are these people finding us? They'll, they'll message her. And, and, you know, like a lot of the, a lot of the ladies will message her because they, you know, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. and and they just feel more comfortable, whatever, whatever the case may be. But and she's about as present on social media as you are, and right. nothing through the kennel really gets advertised on her page either. No, and we tried the promotion thing earlier this year with the with the business page and paid to promote, and we we gathered some some new business from that, but. Just kind of faded away. And yeah, you really got to stay with it and yeah, be consistent and, with and it. And it, I don't know. I just got tired of being on the internet, so I quit doing it. Yeah, I can see. I can see you getting super sick of, because like you know, there's on Monday, when I get up, something's got to go out. Mm-hmm. On Tuesday, when I get up, you know, because I'm running my page, Instagram pages, Bull in the China Shop page, right. Double L page. So each day of the week. That's part of my morning routine right. is putting something out. Now, I get fucking fed up with it, too. And there's day three, four days sometimes where, especially if I'm traveling, 
I don't give a fuck, you know, most <laughs> right. of the time. Right. Just because you need a break from it. But I can see you getting, like, super sick of that. Yeah. Because it's 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 literally present in my mind as soon as I wake up in the morning. Yeah. Like, what am I, what am, what's going on today? Most of the time I've got it planned out the night before or whatever. But if you're going to actually, like, market and promote, you know, you got to be consistent with it. And it's like a grind. It's like anything else, you know. Right. You, you, you're just grinding it out, doing the things that you need to do. But if you don't need to do that, why would you? If you don't need to spend all this time on social media, why would you? Right. Well, I mean, I think that if we did spend more, you know, we would have more, you know, more people coming in. But at the same time, right now, you know, we don't have, we don't have enough puppies to sell. So. Well, that sucks. Well, and that's. Well, that's just a terrible problem to have. <laughs> ah, I can't even keep up. Well, and I don't, I don't want it to be that way. I don't want to have litters to meet client, to meet customers. Right, uh, you're having litters for your breeding program. I, yeah. If I only have, if I have a litter of eight puppies and I and I keep one and don't sell any of them to another bully breeder, they just go to pet homes. I am perfectly okay with that. That's awesome. The fact that people, you know, uh, want to are willing to pay for you know, the work that I've done or we've done, that's, you know, that's a benefit, but I will keep the, the picks and pet home the rest. Even if they're, even if they're worthy of being sold, I don't care if I sell them or not. Well, here's the thing. We, we say pet, pet home and pet quality and yeah, I'm not talking about pet quality. There's some dogs out there. Well, even, we, even, even to me, like pet quality to me like almost implies that there's something wrong with the dog. Right. No. Yeah. It's like from I'm I'm saying from from now on I'm gonna approach it like for companionship purposes. Right. It's not a breeding dog. It's not a show dog. These people bought it for a companion. Right. It's companionship pur- purposes. Right. right. It doesn't have like so a cleft palate or anything. It's, like yeah. That. There's it's no just... negative connotation attached to it. Right. Like when you say a pet quality dog, instantly I think ah oh, motherfucker's got a broken leg or <laughs> right. he come out I don't know he's got a third eye you know well like that's what people think right. or his toenails point to the sky and shit you know like. When you say pet quality, most people think not show quality. Right. That's not what we're talking about. We're just talking about quality dogs being sold as companions. Right. Yeah, and that's and we've we've actually one thing Nationals has done is it created a little buzz around our our local market. People that had no idea what an American bully was now comes out and Taco Tuesday help for that because everybody likes to eat for free, and so people come out. They eat tacos, and they're like, hey, you know, what's what's up with this dog? I'm like, well, you know, maybe we can work something that out. And I've got two um, two females placed with a guy in town that takes very good care of his dogs, doesn't care if they get bred, you know, just loves them to death. And, you know, we've got a litter of axle puppies off of the one now. So that that actually means more to me than selling a dog for – Fuck yeah. For – X amount of dollars to somebody in California that's going to breed it, you know, that just scares the hell out of me. If, if I can't control the situation, mm. but you got a little bit of a control issue. I feel like just with the dogs <laughs> you just, got... and just with axle puppies too. I mean, that's, we've just created such a buzz around, around that. And what's well, your centerpiece, man? That's yeah. your, that's your pride and joy. That's the motherfucker that brought home the multi breed best in show trophy from nationals last year. So, right. You can't, nobody can really blame you for protecting his legacy. Right. You know what I mean? If more people put half of the effort into him and protecting his legacy as they do, you know, if they put half of the effort you guys did into their shit, they would, I mean, there would be a lot more success stories out there. I just feel like. When, when people, you know, when people have the goal in mind to sell to an international market, mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of times they don't understand what comes comes with that. Right. You know what I mean? A, like we've been talking about, you have to have your base built. You have to have the bricks laid. You have to have the stars made. You have to have some sort of celebrity DOG. You mm-hmm. have to. The second thing you have to think about is the actual logistics of the shipping. Mm. Right, the shit that goes into you can't ship an American bully now without a custom crate. 
Right. You know what I mean? You can't ship an American bully on any airline right now without a wooden crate. Mm -hmm. Or you can, I'm sure you can buy an aluminum one, but it has right. to be a reinforced crate. So you're looking at three between 300 and 600 just for the crates. The actual shipping, especially if you're shipping adult dogs. Yep. Like uh, today, I just uh, shipped out Champion Mega Millions, who's uh, three generations of my breedings. Uh, I produced his mom, bought his dad, or her dad, Rain, when he was eight weeks old. So he's technically second generation, excuse me, technically second generation off my stuff. And uh, Red Rose shipped them both to the UK today. Now, this has been a six-month process getting these two dogs ready to actually be shipped. Like you were talking about, they had to have a rabies shot at a certain time. You know, they had to be international microchipped. Yes. Not a regular fucking microchip. No, it's got to be It's got to be an international microchip, right? So which instead of like eight numbers, it has 11 or 14 or some fucking thing. So crazy, man. You have to have... I use... Most of the time, I use a shipper. Mm -hmm. Because they know the ins and outs. You know, the USDA inspection and right. stamp... You know, US, a USDA-approved vet has to stamp your health certificate and approve your health certificate before the dog can get on the plane. Sometimes that can be a pain in the ass. Where I'm at in Kansas, we have one USDA vet in like six hours of driving from me, one USDA vet, and it has to be a Kansas USDA for certain things. The problem is people just don't don't take that shit into consideration. Mm -hmm. So you spend all this time building the fucking building the blocks and building the dogs and then you run into all these hoops that you have to jump through before sh sending a dog out. Have you have you had to do any of that shit? Actually, no, I haven't. I have <clears throat> the dogs that I've sent have been all transported by a a uh, international shipper i guess i get them to california and this guy takes care of everything else for me and in two days they're at their destination so i have personally never sent a dog from my house to china so or you're saying you 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 went through like a shipper yeah yeah and that's yeah, yeah i think that's the best way yeah and, and they cost you a little more money. It well, does. it doesn't cost you. No, it costs the buyer a little more money. But I feel like that's the best way. They know. They've done this. They have experience. Right. They're, you know, the, the airlines know them. They don't get as much flack going right. through to do shit as, as a normal guy does. Yeah. And they know that, they know that, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the, when we, when we um, first set up the China with Steve, the, 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 sh the China. We're just gonna leave that hanging. <laughs> we set up the China, the China deal. We missed, missed the word. Um, the shipper wasn't wasn't in the picture yet, so I was I was going through with my vet, which is just a farm vet. I mean, he's he's a cow guy and really uh, no international shipping experience. Right. Not many people ship an Angus bull to China, you know, <laughs> just, unless it's cut up already. Right, right. But you know, we were looking at this paperwork and we we're like, oh boy, you know. And then our our USDA is in Chicago, so that's a two and a half, three hour drive. Man, this is brutal. But okay, so you guys only have one in the for the state. I'm not. I'm not sure. I would assume that there's one. There's, there's got to be, be one, one downstate. Yeah, there's got to be a couple probably. Probably Springfield, I would say. But still, two and a half hours. I mean, yeah, and that's just for them to stamp your. That's paper. literally most of the time they don't even look at the dog. No. Most of the time, they've been in communication with your vet mm -hmm. the entire week before this happens. You literally are driving three hours to wait 45 minutes in the, in the waiting room yeah. to get a fucking imprint on your piece of paper. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, it sucks, but. It, it sucks, but like you were saying, the, I feel like the work's worth it. Definitely. definitely. You know, the get work, stock. it is a little extra work, but the work's worth it. You're yeah. getting, you know, especially if you've done all this work here domestically to build the name and create right. the star get you know expanding that you know bubble right. to other continents it's well it's so worth it well it's kind of an ego thing too you know like you know <laughs> hey dogs got, on four continents bro <laughs> i got a dog in china you know that's pretty fucking cool 
We're you know we're sending a bunch to Russia. That's that's pretty neat. <coughs> Any in Mexico yet? Not yet, but we do have uh, South America. No, I, I don't we, speak Spanish. You know. See, and that's where my that's people, another thing that you run into my, the language oh, barrier. That's brutal. The China guys. Whew. You know, and it, they they're the, they're Chinese people. Yeah, they don't speak our language. They don't speak. <laughs> no. Well, I mean, they 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 Some could. Of them. But even if they do, texting is mm-hmm. different than talking. Right. So they might be able to, to talk to you in English and understand, but texting is a whole different thing. Yeah, because when the guy contacted me, one guy contacted me from China about Steve, and it was all in their language. And I'm like, boy, I, I can't even begin. I use the translate button, you know, that Facebook gives you. And I was like, that's, that's worthless. <laughs> that's not even. Hey, hey, Facebook. <laughs> That's fucking worthless. That's, that's not even. It is. Wor- yeah. you just take it off there. You waste the space on my screen. <laughs> and I, I actually didn't even respond. Be- I didn't. You know, I didn't want to be rude. Like, hey, I don't understand because maybe he doesn't understand what I just said. Right. And then, like three days later, I got a message from a guy that spoke. It was broken English, but it was at least you know we could kind of have a conversation. And he, you know, explained to me that this was the guy and. And, you know, that's who I dealt with. But there was a huge language barrier. And then when that guy came over to California to get Steve, he called me on the phone because we had to – they had a uh, a different area that they take the pets to after they get off the plane. And they sent me the address, and I sent him a picture. Well, he couldn't read it. So then I'm talking to him, and I'm trying to explain to him – the address, and he's not really, un- and I'm like, oh my god, now my dog's in California, in limbo, <laughs> right? No and, one can yeah, even get in stuffed in a crate. He's been there for you know who knows how long, and you know now we're sitting here trying to have a conversation, and we speak completely different languages, you know, and that's that's it's tough. It's I, tough. I, I've even tried like Google Translate, yeah, terrible. which. It's garbage. Let's be honest. Yeah. It's fucking garbage. Well, they're like so. The sp- but the last thing you want to do is say this. This these are the stipulations. Translate it into a different language and have it read something else. Right. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Because I want very clear cut stipulations right. going into this deal. Do you, do you see what I'm Yo, saying? Yeah. Absolutely. The last thing I want to happen is for me to say can't be bred outside of China. And then it read, feel free to breed this <laughs> right. dog everywhere. And it can, and it can't, that can happen. Like, can so, and can't, that's easy. That's just a T. Right. That's just a T taken <laughs> off of there. Yeah, it's, uh, but the, the, the Mexico thing is, is coming because, um, I'm helping a farmer up the road and, and the, the supervisor is, he's from Mexico, speaks fluent English and obviously speaks fluent Spanish. So, He's kind of setting up some deals, and he goes to Mexico all the time. Oh, nice little go between. Yeah, so nice. he's gonna he's gonna be the transporter, and then take him down there. For like him. a coyote, like a a well, dog legal coyote. Right. Yeah. Make sure you add legal. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna go through the proper. He's not gonna stuff it in his suitcase and send it on down. But so what's? I mean, I'm sure people have have offered to buy Axel internationally. What is the craziest offer you ever got for Axel? Mm, you really want to know? Like what's the, I'm I, like because we you know we've we've heard you know Magoo sold for for half a mil supposedly Casablanca sold for a half a mil supposedly Mr Bean sold also for a mil. He is I have not heard that. <laughs> I made that up. I made that up. <laughs> okay. No, but 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 in, in all seriousness, you know uh, uh, Magoo sold for half a mil Casablanca sold for half a mil. Few other dogs sold for two fifty, hundred, hundred and fifty. What I mean is Axel getting close? Is he getting close to these numbers? It is was, he the highest offered dog? I mean, oh, I can we that. say it's a million? No. Can I say in the title a million dollars for <laughs> no. Axel? No, we're not going to start that. Crap. <laughs> but, no, it's it's above three, but that wasn't even close. So three hundred thousand dollars didn't even get close to make to making you think about selling Not Axel. Even a little bit. Part of it is he's my pet, you know. I mean, so there's an emotional tie there too. But right, and it's fucking difficult, man. Yeah, but you know, also what what he hopefully will do, 
for our program will greatly exceed that number. Hopefully. That's the theory. Right. If not, you know, five years from now. Well, there's I risk. May, there's I risk may, with yeah, everything. I may there's kick risk. myself in the mouth later, but, you know, I just don't think that that was, you know. And once that offer came and I turned it down, I've not gotten one since. So I don't know if everybody talked. And Oh, I, I'm I, sure there's communication going yeah. on. But why, you know, why would they spend 300 k on Axel when they could buy half your litter for, right. for half of that? You know? Mm. No? <laughs> no? You're not getting half the litter for 150 k It's going to be close. See, <laughs> I'm trying to get on Tyler Wilson's level right now. <laughs> that's But that's buying top picks, you know? That's, right, right. That's first male, first female. Or, what did I just say? First male, first female. Yeah. First and second of both. Right. That would be, and that's that price is set so that that you can't, you know, I don't want to. So if you're gonna pay it, it's gonna be if if you want that, you're gonna pay to make it worth, you know, right. me essentially giving up a generation. Yeah, a whole a whole generation right. of your program, unless you're going to try to keep a third pick female or something and breed her in the future, which you're probably gonna do. I would think uh, you're gonna want to keep something either way. Right. And, you know, first pick, second pick, that's a selection thing. Right. What if they pick the two females you thought were yeah. third? You know, in your brain, this is my third and fourth pick. Well, they just took those as first and second. Right. So now I get the, the two that I liked out of the litter anyway. Right. So sometimes that can work out. Sometimes, that's if you have a consistent litter. Right. Sometimes you only have one good dog in the whole fucking litter, <laughs> right. and somebody comes along and buys that thing, and then you're fucked. But Yeah, then you're... Placing dogs and like, so I, I feel like the 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 last thing that you really go through as far as sending something internationally is or selling anything mm. is how fucking hard it is to actually hand them over. Yeah, you know, tough. M- with Mega today and Red Rose today, you know, like I said, I Mega's Mega's four years old. He's, you know been at my house since he was eight weeks old my partner whelped him i basically was feeding him since he was three weeks you mm-hmm. know red red rose was born at, i mean i i pulled her out of the c-section right. you know i actually cleaned her off in the c-section <laughs> right. you know what i'm saying yeah we you know sometimes there's two a couple of a vet and a vet tech and you in there and you don't know which i cleaned that bitch off mm-hmm. when she come out of blue rose Right. I kept half her litter and then narrowed it down to her in the end. You know what I'm saying? That was a major fucking piece of not only my program, but me as a fucking person. Like her and I and Mega too, we spent four years together, three and a half, three years for, for Red Rose. But those are vital parts of my program, stuff that I'm going to use moving forward you know what i mean i have a, a female off of maestro bred the red rose's sister that's going to be used moving forward unfortunately the litter i had with red rose i lost which still burns my burns my ass because the the male that come out of there I, even at 10 days old when when i lost him unbelievable so like it's stuff that i'm going to use in the future you know what i mean i just had a litter off of mega the last litter ever in the united states mm-hmm. So when he, when he goes to, to the UK, he's not even allowed to be bred back in the United States. Right. So th- there's no more litters off him in the United States. So I have control of that. So that's something that now you have to let go of. Right. Don't get me wrong. It makes it easier when the, when the money hits the account. You know what I'm saying? It makes it a little easier. But it was way harder today to drop those dogs off than I expected. Yeah. It's, you know what I mean? It's tough. It's I'm not really a soft guy. <laughs> right. You know, I'm pretty callous about most shit because I've been doing this for 10 years almost. But today, I'm telling you, it was fucking rough today. Like, yeah. I was like, man. <laughs> it's just, it's like, you know, handing over a, a fucking, like, I created both of them. Right. Like, I, me and myself, I created them. You know what right. I mean? So it was, it was just, it's something you don't think about when you're, especially if you give a fuck, like you're talking about Axel, like that's right. your, that's your son, basically. 
especially if you give a fuck about what you're breeding and the dog, the actual dogs that are here in the program. You know, because once you get a bigger program, sometimes you get the, you know, they just become a number. And right. If you if you have something that you're actually connected to and you give a fuck about, like, I feel like my breeding program, like, that's my legacy right now. Mm -hmm. So to give those two up was like giving up a little piece of what the fuck I've been building. It was tough, man. It was difficult. I'll tell you that. Yeah. I feel like sending a, uh, you know, like an eight, well, even a six-month-old, after you go through all the, the hoops, the six-month-old, you don't, you know what's coming, you know? Right. You, that you're, you're keeping that dog that long because you know what you're doing. So I feel like that is a little easier. But like with Steve, that offer came out of the blue, you know, and, and he was pre-Axel before Axel come along. So he was kind of like the center of our of our program for a while. And then, you know, even even now I still get people asking about Steve. So yeah, to send him off was it was tough. It was really tough. Yeah, cuz that was like after you guys kind of rebuilt, yeah, that cut was, down and rebuilt. That was your first first litter. First litter yeah. after that. That was right? our first that was our rebuild. So he, I mean, and, and he's a fucking nice dog. Yeah. The headpiece, he had the the look, the flash, the bone, the proportion. It's not surprising to me that they that they wanted him, but at the same time, you know, the, the money that these people are throwing at you, it's right. like, it's hard as fuck to say no. Right. But then at the same time, when you actually go to make the, to make the deal and hand the dog off, you're like, fuck. Fuck, man. Well, is that money in there? Is is it in the account? Because I'm going to correct you man. because when the, when they're talking those numbers, I don't know about you, but I've never seen that much money in my bank account at one time. No, I probably made that much, you know, since I was 16. I have not. <laughs> but I you know, have not. When that money, when that kind of money is being talked about, you're like, get that motherfucker on plane tomorrow. I forgot his name already. Then when you do, <laughs> it's like fuck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's part of, you know, I was kind of on a rant last week about, you know, there's certain things that come along with this fucking lifestyle. Mm, definitely. You know, being a responsible breeder means certain things. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, selling international and being one of the top level guys in the country also means you have to do certain things. Right. You can't. I mean, I can't, I should, I'm not going to speak for you, but I can't keep everything I produce. Right. So if somebody comes along with a number like that, knowing that I'm going to have to eventually move some stuff out, you do, you're, you're going to go with it for the, right. you know, the majority of the time, but it's fucking hard, man. If it was only six months old, eight months old, I don't, it probably right. would have been all right, but these motherfuckers are <laughs> adults. Like, right. You know, grown up with, you know, it's, it's just difficult. It's something it's, it's much more difficult for than I thought it was going to be. And I've been doing this a long time mm -hmm. and I've sold dogs, good money before, you know, handed over really good dogs for big boxes of money before. Like the, that's all I'm, I've been there, done that. It was today was difficult. Like the, you know, the other stuff I sold wasn't my production. I didn't create right. that even though I raised it and it was still, uh, you know, you're connected. Something's a little different when you fucking created that. It was tough. It was, it was way more difficult than I thought. I'm telling you. Seeing the softer side. It's, it's not even like, it's not even like a, a an emotional thing. It's like, a, it's more like a sentimental thing. Right. It's more like a, if, if, if I didn't know they were going to really great spots, right. I would be really fucking have mixed emotions about it. I'm completely okay with them going completely happy with the, the deals and the transactions and the people, but the actual handing over part was like, <laughs> fuck man. Yeah. Well, yeah. And then I, we talked about it really like that. There's that limbo period. Like, yeah, right these, now these dudes are going on a plane. Yeah. Like there's a lot that can happen. The plane could go down. I mean, Especially these heavy breathing motherfuckers. Right. There's a there's a lot of and you know when 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 they're on the plane, like in my instance, you know the guy was on the plane. Steve went over as a service dog, so he was in the cab. 
But obviously, there's no. I was messaging him like a 14 year old girl trying to get hold of my first boyfriend. You know, I'm sure when he got off the plane, he was like, "Who is this Jesus. weirdo?" You know, but it's just that 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 fact of not knowing for those couple days. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, you know, mine was mine was just a day. You know, it was what, 17 hours or whatever. I'm in that right now. Yeah, I'm in that right now, and that sucks because you can't like your dogs don't have cell phones. You can't call them. Uh, <laughs> they don't. They, the the, the facility do doesn't have a camera that right. I can watch them. Like, even if they did, I'm not sure if I would. Yeah, it's. <sighs> It's it's risky for sure because even though it's a, a reputable company and, and shit like that mm-hmm. and they you know everything's done by the book, it's still that you know yeah, Mother Nature forty eight hours yeah of a window between right now when they yeah. were dropped off well six hours ago and then when they arrive with the new people in in the UK like mm-hmm. it's gonna be two days where I'm probably not gonna sleep like <laughs> I, I should be passed out tired right now been up almost 18 hours almost 24 hours right now wide awake (laughs) don't even know if i'm going to be able to sleep just until that's you know until they're there and safe i'm i'm probably going to be on edge the whole time but that's just shit that people people want you know everybody oh china just called oh did they (laughs) because if they did they would have you would have had a a different conversation than China just called. Yeah, because I you promise know? you, those guys are. If they want it, they will get it. If they want it, they are coming after it. Right. Promise. And you. even if you, even if you say no, they're coming back. You know, and it. They want, they want what they want. And they're gonna get it. Right. And that's you know that's what happened with us is. The first offer came in and, and I was like you know, <laughs> Jess, this is kind of. It's kind of, this is kind of okay. <laughs> it's not like, bad. And she's like, no, not even, not even a chance. So I messaged and I said, you know, thank you for the offer, but I think we're going to have to decline. And I didn't hear from him for like five days. Five days later, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> what is going on here? I'm like, Jesse. <laughs> like, <laughs> Hello. <laughs> you know, it's just, those, they're, they're, uh, I wish that I had that kind of money to build the program like that, you know. Yeah, no shit. Like right now, no shit. You know, because they're they're buying dogs, they're buying dogs that the reputation's already built, and then well, the work's been done. Yeah, and the in the guys that say, "Oh, China's calling," even though that's aggravating, those people are building a reputation for China, like that. Now that's sought after, and so when the dog goes over there, those guys are already getting getting uh you know contacted right and and i mean i feel like it's it's a double-edged sword man yeah you know there's a lot of money to be made but at the same fucking time you you gotta do certain things to be even be on the radar to get that money you know and i i'm not ashamed to admit it China hasn't called me one fucking time. <laughs> yeah, but you've got... I don't know what's going on. The UK's never called me. Hey, so. <laughs> hey, China. Hey, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> no, that, that's not true either. Uh, I mean, but I, have, I haven't I have had... I had one offer made for Maestro. It wasn't even close. But I don't even know what the number would be for him. Right. You know? Like that's going to be a difficult thing too. Until I know I have the next in line, which could be in the garage. <laughs> but until I know that that next in line is there, I don't know if I could sell him. Also, he's since he's been living in the fucking house, he's like my son, you know. Yeah. So it's going to be that one would be super difficult, super difficult. But I don't know. I the whole point of this fucking podcast is just 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 to open some eyes about the shit that goes into, you know, selling dogs internationally. Everybody wants to be on that train, but <clears throat> there's a lot of shit you got to do to even get, get into consideration to be on that train. I'm sure winning nationals is on the top of everybody's fucking list anyway. <laughs> if it's not, what are you doing? But I'm sure not just winning nationals. There's, there's 
so many other ways to get on that radar than just winning nationals. But if you want a shortcut, <laughs> that's a pretty good way to get November 11th, Navy Pier, Chicago, Illinois. <laughs> Seriously, I'm dead serious. Like, there's no better place. If you, if you want bang for your buck as far as exposure, networking, promotion, mm -hmm. there's no better place if you're going to go one show a year than, than the Nationals. Yeah, everybody's there. I mean, everybody's either there or watching right. or listening or talking about Nationals. So, I mean, really, it's a, to me, it's a shortcut. Like, that's really where... That was that's been my approach from day one. Like I went to first my first or second year in with with dogs that were being recognized. Two thousand ten, went to the Atlanta Nationals. Went from literally no one knew who the fuck I was to six people knew who I was. You know what I mean? But that's six more than I had the day before. I don't know if it's actually six, but you get what I'm saying. Like I had Kev Green shoot a commercial for me down there at that Nationals. I had. You know, we showed dogs, like we had stack offs, we had social media buzz afterwards, which social media then was the MSM boards and right. the Elite Edge boards. That was social media then, but you which had, is way better than it is. Yeah, yeah, you had you put up your stack pictures the day after and the boards were just buzzing the whole week after from the from the nationals, two weeks after from the nationals. 2012, same thing. When I brought Jackpot out, when I really wanted to make a name for Jackpot, 2012 and 13, Dallas and New Jersey. If you want to get exposure, if you want to network with as many people as possible in one one show, if you're from another country and you want to spend the money to go to one show, Nationals should be that show. Nationals took... Axel from a fifty dollar dog. No, I'm just playing. Fifty. <laughs> now, a Axel or Nationals can literally make you like make you in one day. Yeah. Uh, obviously, if you show up with some bullshit, it can break you. Also, right. You could go home as the guy with the bullshit. <laughs> That's very possible. You know, check your blinders before you walk in the building. I'm just saying, but. If you show up with quality stuff and you make an, uh, an impression, that can be a huge impression. That can go a long way. Agree or disagree? Oh, absolutely. I, I have one, one thing to add, too. That the, the uh, hmm, how do I say it? This, all this, this whole conversation of international market begins in the whelping box. Right, fact. If, if you're not producing dogs that people aren't, wanting in the states or you know if, if your buddy comes over and is like ah, wow you know like not so good you're probably not going to get a guy from china to offer you 70, russia australia 70, south africa <laughs> yeah. uk like, this isn't it, it, you know this isn't this isn't <coughs> something that that comes from producing <coughs> mediocre dogs like you have to do your research and and you know, go out and find the dogs. Don't breed the – if the hype dog is the dog that best fits your female, so be it. But if you're just going to breed to a hype dog to try to sell one to China, you're probably in it for the wrong reasons anyway. Right. Well, You've got to progress your program. If you're not progressing your program, okay, you're going to sell one dog to China, one hype dog, or who knows, wherever. But if that's it, then, I mean, you've peaked and now, now you suck because you just sold your best dog to – another country that you're probably not going to use again. Yeah, you're you're probably never going to see again. Right. So, I think that's fucking spot on, man, right. because if you're not producing dogs that are that are wanted here, right. They're not going to be wanted anywhere. Right. They follow our lead, right. right? So what what is popular here, that's what gets that's what is made popular other places. At the same time, like like you were saying, the shit is is starts in the whelping box. Rocco was no one until Khan made him right. a superstar. Axel was literally no one in the backyard until you made him a superstar. Right, right. 
producing good dogs is where it starts. You yeah. can you can build that quality dog into the celebrity dog, but it's really hard to to turn a mediocre dog into a celebrity dog just because people are going to see through that shit. Mm -hmm. There's about four of them I can name right now. I'll be nice. Actually, people people are actually calling me out because I don't call people out and talk shit. <laughs> That's risky. Like, like no. Eh, listen, first of all, YouTube comments are like the worst possible place. Like, it's hilarious, but at the same time, it's like, what is wrong with these people? Why do they hate me? But like. You know, it's it's hard to turn on that mediocre dog. Like you have to have the quality there. Right. At, that's the real base. Building all the blocks on top of that quality to turn the dog into a, a a star. That's you know after you get the quality out of the welcome box. I think you're spot on with that. And I I, I pe think people don't realize like Dax was no one until Ed made him someone. Right. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of dogs out there that are nice ass dogs, but with people behind them that that don't know what to do, right. that will never get to anywhere close to that level. But you know, there's dogs out there as nice as some of the top dogs in the ring, but are never going to get to that quote unquote celebrity dog level, must see dog level, because of the shit or the people behind, not the shit, but the the people and promotion and like the, the knowledge and experience just isn't behind them. So they're never going to get to that level, even though they're quality dogs, mm -hmm. but the quality has to be there first, you know? Yeah. Anyway, I mean, I got nothing else to say about it. I said my piece, I had a fucking long ass day <laughs> dropping those dogs off. I almost, honestly, I almost drove right by, but, that's all. Literally, all I could think about was like, wh how? Why was that so difficult? Like, why? I knew this was coming for six fucking months. The dogs have been <laughs> bought for a minute. You know, I don't know. Just some shit to think about, people. I think I'm gonna run a little bit of outro. I just hit buttons. I don't really do anything. I just hit the button. Stuff happens. Uh, episode sixty-five. The Bull in the China Shop podcast, the first and only podcast dedicated to bull breeds and the American bully lifestyle. Now that Rob Lee has the podcast out, I don't know if I can say that. I don't know if it's the only one, but I'm not sure if Rob Lee's podcast is bull breeds or just the American bully. I'm staying with it. First and only podcast dedicated. Anyway episode 65 in the books thank you once again mr mr wilson for joining me yes, sir. i think this is fourth appearance i'm due for a t-shirt i think once once you get to five i think i gotta put the cutoff at five because i think btk is also at four so that's like two t i'm about to have to hand out two t-shirts <laughs> anyway all right motherfuckers i love your faces I really do. Even if you're a fuckbag on YouTube, commenting on my shit, telling me to kill myself, that has, that has literally happened. I love your face still, man. I'm not, I'm not offended by the kill yourself comment. I still love you. I'll still see you motherfuckers next week. There's no way to stop me. Kill myself or not, there's no way to stop me. See you next week.